Very good. Well, I now make it exactly six o'clock. So at the risk of keeping a few people waiting in that waiting room, the virtual waiting room, I think we'll, we'll make a start. Well, a very warm welcome everyone to the third event in this autumn series of uh, online events related to the broad theme of the Insiders Outsiders project, which many of you I'm sure will already know about. More specifically, tonight's Tonight's session forms part of a whole series of events that started <coughs> off during Refugee Week in June and then continued through early uh, August, in fact, late July, early August, on the theme of the internment of so-called enemy aliens by the British government. And I'm sure most of you who are here will know full well that it is a particularly significant year to commemorate that episode, that murky episode in British wartime history, because of course it's the 80th anniversary of when it happened, 1940, of course. Now, I'm really looking forward to this event. I know quite a lot about internment, uh, but what I don't know about is the Canadian side of the story. And um, I won't say too much more for the moment, but I'd obviously like to introduce our speaker, Nancy Greenspan. Some of you will have had the pleasure of listening to her in late July of this year when she gave a riveting talk about the so-called atomic spy, Klaus Fuchs. It is um, recorded on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel if anybody would like to uh, listen to it again or indeed to listen to it full stop um, for posterity. And um, I think Nancy herself will tell us, and I will just mention it now, that really her interest in the whole Canadian aspect of wartime internment of mostly Jewish refugees from Nazism was sparked, was fueled by the research she was doing on Klaus Fuchs. She came to it, in other words, slightly obliquely. Um, I will also say, uh, jumping the gun slightly, that I'm rather hoping, I think there are quite a few Canadians in the audience, and I'd love to hear from them as to how much is actually known within Canada itself of this history. But anyway, I'll leave it at that for the moment. So let me introduce our speaker. Nancy Thorndike Greenspan started off uh, her professional life as a health economist, but soon began a writing career as the co-author of four books with her husband, the late child psychiatrist Stanley Greenspan. She's the author of two fascinating biographies, The End of the Certain World, The Life and Science of Max Born, who of course was another of that stellar array of talented, creative emigres, in this case, in the sciences who came to this country, um, published in 2005, and the recently published book that I've already mentioned, Atomic Spy, uh, wonderful title, The Dark Lives of Klaus Fuchs, which was published, in fact, just this year. She served on the board of numerous environmental organizations and is now a board member of the American Institute of Physics, sorry, Physics Foundation. And this is the bit that I really loved because I don't think we have many speakers who can claim to be <laughs> near champion standard, or perhaps champion standard ice skaters. How wonderful, Nancy. Uh, an ice skater, she spends her free time at the rink and she lives in Bethesda, Maryland. So a wonderful example of how Zoom does indeed transcend geographical boundaries, one of the few blessings uh, in disguise or the blessings of, of the current uh, COVID situation. So without further ado, Nancy, over to you and thank you very much for agreeing to talk. Well, I should just say, actually, of course, I've forgotten the housekeeping rules. I've already asked everybody to keep themselves mute if you wouldn't mind to avoid any background noise. And indeed, because of the numbers and they're mounting all the time, I'm just going to admit some of the latecomers. Um, we will, I think, restrict ourselves to uh, questions via the chat function, at least in the first instance. So start whenever you feel like asking questions, but through the chat function, please. OK, over to you, Nancy. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and for having me. It's lovely to be able to talk about this topic. It's the first time I've ever talked about it in depth, and it was uh, interesting to me to put the whole thing together. Uh, I must tell you, Bethesda, Maryland is only a couple of miles from Washington, D.C., so here we are all sitting on the edge of our seats. It is a very interesting time. Um, and uh, next, and a, a week from today is a really big day for us. So I am now going to go to my PowerPoint and begin. Let me just do this quickly. Okay. Um, here we go. All right. Um, as Monica said, I, mean, I got into this because of researching uh, Klaus Fuchs, who was a German refugee, enemy alien, and an internee in camp, camps L and M from mid-July of 1940 to the end of that year. This research brought me to spend countless hours at the Imperial War Museum 
And there I listened to and read dozens of internee interviews and page through diaries, both in German and Auf Deutsch, um, because Fuchs was an important figure in the camps. My research led me to a fuller picture of the camp and the terrible conditions that the refugees suffered, including the strife that arose within the camps. Conflicts among the internees over how to handle the cruel and inconsidered roundup by the British government might be expected, but tensions concerning religion surprise me. This story begins with the internees' voyage to Canada because it set up some of the later dynamics in the camp. Prior to this, as many of you know, the refugees had experienced weeks of starvation, isolation, and fear while in camps in England and on the Isle of Man. Describing those first days, one internee wrote in his diary that we are, quote, caged animals. On July 3rd of 1940, a white troop ship, the HMT Ettrick, docked in Liverpool Harbor. 1,300 refugees, mostly German Jews, climbed the gangplank and wound down the stairs deep into the bowels to the two lower decks in the luggage room. They confronted a nauseating stench of rotten food, a few naked light bulbs hanging from the ceilings, and portholes nailed shut. Their only entry and exit was one narrow door covered with barbed wire. The Ettrick, which a few weeks earlier had evacuated soldiers from Dunkirk, was designed to hold 1,550 soldiers. It now held 1,300 refugees in one half and about an equal number of Nazi POWs and um, Italian fascists in the other half. The refugees were fed two meals a day and sometimes went in shifts for fresh air up on the, the, the higher deck for a couple of hours. The Nazis POWs received three meals under the Geneva Convention and more time up above. When the paths of the two groups crossed, the Nazis enjoyed taunting the refugees, boasting that Germany was about to win the war and that the refugees would soon be back there. At night, the refugees heard German war songs filled with anti-Semitism and bloodlust booming through the wall that separated them. At the start, the crew handed internees a limited number of hammocks to be hung from the ceiling. The rest of the men, crammed together on the floor, grabbed whatever sleeping space they could find. The defining events of the trip began almost immediately just because of that uh, configuration. On the first night, vomit and excrement from seasick internees and hammocks flowed down onto those on the floor who were also sick. The place quickly became a wash in humid fluids because the barbed wire do covered door was locked and guarded until 6 a.m. There was no access to a lab. A week later, there was a severe case of food poisoning or some suspected intentional addition of a laxative to the food. By this time, the men had better access to the food, but it's still, the, the conditions were hideous. As one um, of the internees memorialized it, quote, a sight worse than anything I've ever seen confronts me there. His pissoirs are choked with vomit and shit. On the walls, on the doors, on the handles, simply everywhere, end of quote. Quickly and unselfishly, volunteers armed with buckets and mops and stripped naked except for wellies spent four hours ankle deep in waste, scrubbing the uh, wash basins and the toilet stalls with bare hands, there were no gloves. When the cleanup was finished and everybody was pleased, a big issue arose of who should reserve, receive the, the praise for this work. The internees had divided into cliques on, um, when they got on the boat such as the intellectuals, the gangsters, the musicians, and the communists. The Cambridge group, which was a subset of the intellectuals, laid claim to the cleanup honors, but the communists felt that they had done all the work. The two groups were led by Count von Lingen 
and, quote, General Hans Kahler, respectively. Lingen, not an ordinary aristocrat, was in reality Prince Frederick of Prussia, son of the crown prince, grandson of Kaiser Wilhelm II, and great-great-grandson of Queen Victoria. The queen's granddaughter, Princess Alice Anne Lingen's cousin, was wife of the Canadian Governor General. Tall, blonde, blue-eyed, polite, and immaculately groomed, even on the Ettrick, somehow, the 28-year-old Count was every inch a Hohenzollern. To avoid attention, he had assumed the name Lingen upon arriving in Cambridge. To avoid negative publicity, the British government had barred his getting a special exemption to internment. 41-year-old Hans Kahler was a military man and the son of one. He had fought in the Great War and the Spanish Civil War, where he commanded the Austro-German uh, Battalion in the 11th International and became friends with Ernest Hemingway. It was rumored that Hemingway modeled General Hans, a minor but praised character uh, in For Whom the Bell Tolls, on Collar. True or not, the celebrity gave Collar added panache and the rank of general among the internees when he in fact was only a colonel. As with Lingen, Collar was a man of secrets. His charismatic facade hid a recruiter for Russian military intelligence, a vital factor in Klaus Fuchs's life who became a spy for the Russians soon after getting out of internment. The truth of the cleanup was that the groups who did it worked in shifts. But Klaus Fuchs held on to the perception that the communists had done all the work, while the Cambridge group merely straightened up their own patch on the floor while ignoring poor German Jews nearby them. To him, it was the epitome of class struggle. The journey took 10 days because the ship sailed a northerly route to avoid U-boats. A ship that had left the day before them, the Arendora Star, had been torpedoed with great loss of life and they had heard about it. Sandwiched into their space so far down below, the internees on the Ettrick knew they would face the same fate if hit. There was no way out. One internee described the journey as a living hell, another as the longest 10 days of his life, and yet another with his pants almost falling off while he had lost a stone during the trip. Tugs pulled the ship into Quebec City, Harbor on July 13th after standing on the deck for a, in the searing sun with no food and little water the 1300 emaciated young men disembarked. The pier was heavily guarded by soldiers armed with bayonets who eyed them warily and took their suitcases later ransacking the suitcases. Buses drove the men up to the heights of the city through the gates of the Massas Citadel onto the Plains of Abraham. The Canadian military had constructed a camp for troops waiting to ship out to the European front. Now it was outfitted as a prison compound surrounded by barbed wire and sentry posts. The new Camp L imprisoned 793 Category B and C internees intermingled with about 90 pro-Nazi internees. Guards treated the men roughly and hustled them into one of the wooden huts. The sergeant major yelled at them to strip naked for venereal disease inspection. So naked, starving, and vulnerable, surrounded by soldiers who only spoke French, the internees stood helpless as the soldiers emptied the internees' pockets, transferring some of the belongings into the internees' bag and the more valuable ones into their own pockets. Everything was gone that they had, basically, for the internees. Finally, at 1 a.m., 17 hours after their last meal, the men rotated into the mess hall to eat a slice of bread and a slab of gelatinous meat called bully beef. Then they got a few hours of sleep. Each hut held 100 men in a room designed for fewer than 80. They slept in bunk beds. Barbed wire covered every window. The door was locked at night, and again, there was no laugh in the hut. 
On the second day, a couple hundred Nazi POWs appeared in the, the camp, strutting around in their uniforms. One refugee asked himself if the Canadians and British realized the impact of putting refugees with Nazis. Quote, no, surely not, he said. They think we're one and the same, all Germans, he wrote in caps. Unlike the 90 Nazi internees who came with them the night before, the officials did house the POWs in separate huts. A week later, they marched away. As on the Isle of Man, the huts elected fathers and formed a council. The leaders of the Ettrick's uh, laboratory cleanup brigades, Hans Kahler and Count von Lingen, were each fathers, as was Klaus Fuchs. Um, Camp Commander Major uh, C.W. Woods appointed, appointed Lingen camp leader, which meant he was the internee who brought complaints to Whigs and took instructions back to the other hut fathers. The majority of the refugees admired both Lingen and Collar for their able but different late leadership. The former used collaboration, the latter much more confrontational. The communists, particularly Collar and Fuchs, who was by then Collar's deputy in the communist clique, fumed that the son of the former crown prince should represent refugees. At the first council meeting, the Hutt fathers confronted the unsettling question of why the uh, Canadians treated them as dangerous. They composed a letter stating that they were loyal to the crown and not fifth colonists, which was the fear initially of even for rounding them up. They delivered it to Major Wiggs, who believed them. He had already formed his own opinion, remarking sardonically, I never knew so many Jews were Nazis. The answer from a Canadian official explained the why. Canada had agreed to take 3,000 German POWs and 4,000 German internees described by the British as, quote, so dangerous in attitude and design that their presence in England at a time of threatened invasion was a menace to the safety of this nation, end of quote. The refugees were stunned to, to discover that they were part of this 4,000. It was a result of the British lacking time to weed out just the dangerous ones, so they just shoved them on this, get them out of there. And quickly, the situation became more serious. Canadian authorities provided the internees with stationery with the words prisoner of mail emblazoned on the envelopes and postcards. Incensed refugees threatened to smash up the camp. But they all agonized over whether to use the stationery because it had been weeks since they had contacted their families. But ultimately, they united against using it. While everyone resented the POW status, the Jews had an overriding fear. As one young Jewish refugee wrote, quote, so the English are in the position now to turn us over to Hitler in return for English prisoners of war. This is the prospect for us refugees from Nazi oppression, exclamation point, end of quote. Looking for a solution, the Hutt Father Council proposed crossing out POW mail and inserting civilian internee mail. Camp Commander Wiggs approved the chain change and after modifying the stationery, the refugees wrote home that they were safe. Days later, sacks of letter appeared in the camp. The censors in Ottawa had rejected all male with crossouts. Some refugees gave in and wrote their families on the POW paper. Others protested by sending the POW postcard with only their name and status in Canada. Hans Koller with Klaus Fuchs used the POW issue to form a refugee committee. It was mostly Jewish, but the communists were involved. It was an action that, that uh, gained them a larger base of support, basically. This faction, which pushed confrontation rather than cooperation, staged a mail strike for a couple of weeks. 
but finally broke down and wrote uh, one letter to their families highlighting the POW classification. The attorney's lot had improved generally. With the bountiful Canadian farms, they finally had enough to eat, uh, something that they had not had that luxury for over two months of, from the other camps. Now, besides their ache for freedom, which they felt every day, the major problem was boredom. Their only assigned task was to clear space for exercise in the rocky field that surrounded the huts. Otherwise, their day began at the 6.30 a.m. Reveille and continued with the prescribed activities, meals, inspections, etc., until 11 p.m. All reading materials were banned and removed. This in a camp that was an intellectual powerhouse. As Major Wiggs exclaimed, quote, some of the brainiest people in Canada are in this camp. From within the barbed wire, the world would gain a future Nobel Prize winner in biochemistry at Max Boritz, developers of the steady state theory of the universe, engineers, industrialists, journalists, painters, architects, and professors. Many a name laid a bore, sir, before it. By September, they had founded a university and cultural center. The list of classes ran from learning a trade, such as bookbinding or bricklaying, to preparing for British matriculation exams to study higher level university subjects. Musicians, of which many were professional and very good, created a cultural landscape with concerts in the mess hall or outside. To accompany the violins and flutes and other instruments that men had brought with them, the sympathetic Major Wiggs brought in a piano. He had really taken up the um, internees cause and they, they became friends with him. Staging and lighting gradually appeared. The Quebecois listened to the performances from surrounding Battlefields Park, a broad swath of grass and rolling hills that trailed down the St. Lawrence River. The internees used this extra attention to advertise who they really were. They hung a sign crafted from rugs and sackcloth on the wall of a hut. It read in both English and French, quote, we are refugees from Nazi oppression. These efforts were short lived. Icy winds and rain howled across the St. Lawrence River. As that happened, a, room, a rumor circulated that they were about to be removed to another camp. Uninsulated huts at Camp L couldn't protect them from the impending frigid winter air. Within two weeks, the Canadian Director of Internment Operations requested the hut fathers to draw up a list of professions and trades by name, religion, and original tribunal category, the ABC category. A week later, he asked for the count of Jews and Gentiles. This raised the inevitable and polarizing question what are the definitions of Gentile and Jew? The term Jew, the Hutt fathers were told, quote, means a person of Jewish faith or race. The Hutt fathers provided the count, 498 Jews, 121 persons of Jewish descent, and 141 persons of non-Jewish descent, parens Aryan. The same day, guards hung prison numbers on the internees, took their photographs, then fingerprinted one finger. One internee described it as very Dachau-like. The parsing of Gentile, Aryan, and Jewish provoked other parallels, the fatal racial divisions in, Nur in Hitler's Nuremberg laws. On September 27th, the internees learned that they would be split up on racial grounds and sent to new camps. 141 Gentiles to an Aryan camp, the rest to a Jewish camp. Complaints from Orthodox Jews about working on the Sabbath or having pork sausage on the menu had convinced the authorities to create a kosher camp. To soften this reaction, the authorities described the new Jewish camp as a model with every amenity. Lingham, Collar, and others drafted a protest to Major Whigs. The internees thought of separation in terms of Nazi versus non-Nazi, not race or religion. New friendships among 
Jews, Protestants, and Catholics had blurred religious boundaries. Major Wiggs wrote a letter to the Director of Internment Operations supporting the refugee's position. The director refused to alter his decision. Canadian officials knew the total number of Gentiles, 141, but not the names. When surveyed, only 80 of the Gentiles identified themselves, leaving 61 unidentified. For days, Major Wiggs told Lingen to bring him a list of the full 141 or he would draw one up himself. He had his orders, he said, and he didn't care how half Jews, confessing Jews, and non-confessing Jews regarded themselves, and neither did headquarters. He wanted the mix, missing 61 names. Schemes had floated up to fill the Aryan quota, Jews who wanted to stay with Gentile friends considered losing a Jewish parent and becoming half Jews. Gentiles who wanted to go to the Jewish camp suddenly discovered Jewish grandmothers in the family tree. They still had the definition that they were supposed to follow um, that the um, internment operations had given them. A few Jews, members of the National Jewish Party demanded that the new camp have only Jews because quote, you can never trust an Aryan, quote. Anti-fascist Aryans, they argued, could convert to good Jews by simply changing their views. But most of the internees still viewed the division as Nazi versus non-Nazi. This fight became ugly when Jews who considered the religious divide anathema called those in the National Jewish Party, quote, Jewish Nazis. For one turn, internee, as he said, it was, quote, the worst discord in the camp. For another, it boiled down to where Kala and his group were sent. The missing 61 were the non-Jewish political refugees for the most part. The primary worry for them was the makeup of the Aryan camp. Would it be filled with Nazis? In which case, they would not survive very long. Collar used this refugee committee he and folks had put together, which was mainly made up of the Jews who loathed the, loathed the idea of racial separation to thwart the government's intent. Folks summarily took charge from Lincoln and manipulated the numbers to ensure that the non-Jewish communists went to the kosher camp. And he made sure that Lincoln went to the Aryan camp. On the morning of October 15th, closely guarded and wearing uniforms with large red circles on the back, it's their POW uniform, and they, the men thought of that circle as a target, 618 internees walked to the train in a drizzle. Traveling several hours south, they arrived at the quote, model camp in the small town of Sherbrooke at 1.30 p.m. The men looked out the windows and saw two huge, seemingly abandoned buildings surrounded by barbed wire fence. Disembarking, they traped through the mud and rain into the largest one and beheld a sight. Crisscrossing train tracks, a stone floor covered with a layer of foul smelling mud, several large pits in the floor half filled with stagnant water, Puddles of rainwater either blown in through broken window panes or leaked through the wood, the roof. And that wasn't all. Dust and soot covered six stinky indoor latrines, five cold water taps, and six hanging bare light bulbs. The empty buildings were part of a railroad depot. For the men, Camp N, as it became, was, quote, worse than imagination could have invented. The worst was yet to come. That evening, when they loudly objected to the imputed dump and their treatment, the sage sergeant major, a bull of a man with, as they described, malicious eyes and a hateful gleam, called them dirty Jews and yelled that he would treat them like mutineers. Looking out the windows, the internees saw guards setting up machine guns. That night, they had an apple for dinner and slept where they could. The next day, they threatened a hunger strike if they weren't transferred. 
The commander retaliated with his own threat to shut the doors, turn off the lights, turn off the heat, and cut off rations. If that didn't work, to request Ottawa to transfer them to a Nazi camp. A Canadian officer, he had gone to Cambridge, recognized some of the internees, interceded and resolved the conflict peacefully. Within an hour, the internees formed an executive committee similar to the Camp El Hut Council and requested that the commander ask a representative from the Canadian National Committee for Refugees to come to the camp to meet with them. And then the animosity that had started in Camp L between the communists and some Jews, especially the Orthodox, spilled out. By this time, the men had seen an article from the Manchester Guardian that championed their plight. In London, some MPs dared to mention the word release. Parliamentary pressure caused the government to issue a white paper at the beginning of August 1940. It detailed 18 categories of Class C internees who were eligible for release. The Orthodox Jews who considered its claim for release to be more sympathetic wanted to remain separate from the communists so as not to jeopardize its chances. Other Jews wanted to be released in Canada, not Britain. The communists accused them of disloyalty to Britain, and they also feel, feared that their own interests would be marginalized. It was the National Committee's assurances of fairness when their representative came, uh, fairness to all the refugees, refugees that decreased this tension. Camp life continued. The men worked to make the camp habitable, cleaning and constructing the needed facilities. There was no room for a university or for privacy, but they did get regular mail deliveries. And basically the whole place was uh, bunk beds with a little bit that you can see of space that they had. By November of 1940, with the Germans no longer on the doorstep, the British government decided it could address the quote, vocal element, the internees supporters in the comments, quote, the rough and ready measures adopted in the early summer, it said, had been justified by the danger during that period, but we can now afford to take a less stringent line. The less stringent line was Alexander Patterson, His Majesty's Commissioner of Prisons in Britain and a true social reformer. He was the perfect ambassador. He arrived at Camp Inn in mid-November Frigid weather, wearing a tweed suit, a hat, and no overcoat. The men immediately liked him when they saw how he looked, and he became their savior and messiah. For three days, he sat in a makeshift office high up in a loft, interviewing 350 internees from Category C, eventually clearing 167 for release in December. Just before Christmas, this group boarded the Tisdale, T Teesville in Halifax Harbor. Uh, actually, it's like a 27 hour train ride for them to get there and feasted on a dinner that one internee deemed the best he had ever eaten. They sailed the next day in a convoy. With the Battle of the Atlantic in full force, they crisscrossed towards Iceland to avoid U-boats. Unlike the trip over, they traveled like grown-ups, they said, staying in cabins, sleeping on clean sheets, eating good food, and having no guards. But they slept in their clothes and wore life belts. The sea was choppy, breakers washed over the bow, and new boats were an invisible and deadly threat. Seventeen days later, they cut through a minefield near the Irish coast and reached the Liverpool docks around 9 p.m. on January 11, 1941. Air raid sirens screamed, delaying their disembarkment. With its access to the Atlantic and its war construction industry, Liverpool was under constant threat from German bombers. Immigration officers processed the men at uh, Heighton Camp and gave them ration books and train tickets. Internment for this small group 
was finally over. A former internee, uh, and I interviewed four or five of them, told me that when later interviewed, many interviewees downplayed the constant fear, anxiety, and despair they all underwent. But he said it was very real at the time. I have a fuller description of British internment in my biography, Atomic Spy, as uh, Monica mentioned. If you have a deeper interest in these particular issues or class folks, whom I spoke about here last summer, please read Atomic Spy and tell your friends. Also go to my website, atomicspythebook.com to watch some, a few interesting videos of the time. I, they're, they're British, I think you'll enjoy them. And I thank you very much uh, for your being here and your attention. And I'm ready to tr answer any questions that I can. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Nancy. Do you want to stop screen sharing so we can begin to see yeah. everybody as well? There we go. Wonderful, good. Wasn't that fascinating? I'm sure everybody will agree with me. Absolutely fascinating, but of course, also deeply shocking and raising all sorts of difficult questions which simply don't go away. Now, as I was expecting and indeed hoping, many of the people who are listening, have been listening in, have personal connections to the whole experience of <clears throat> internment and of course, in internment in Canada in particular. And I'm just wondering how best to do this. I, I've been sort of keeping half an eye on the, uh, <clears throat> the chat. Uh, texts coming in and uh, many of them are identifying themselves as you know having that link to the history so perhaps um, we should start should I just read through them in the first instance some of most of them are not actually questions but I think it might be quite useful Nancy for you too to sort of see mm -hmm. who's in the audience and what kind of connections and yeah um, I mean, I'll take notes can, yeah absolutely can be um, <laughs> uh, can be established and I'm sure am I right Nancy that you'd be very happy to hear from anybody who might want to be in touch with you directly may I absolutely your, your email address would that be absolutely okay. wonderful thank you very much okay. sure so, it'll be fun if they um, do get get in touch okay. Um, lovely. So first of all, Penny Rubinoff to everyone. I'm Canadian and I know nothing about it. That's why I'm attending the session. And that absolutely confirms what I said at the very beginning. This is still utterly understudied, isn't it? Sort of neglected corner of history, of British history, of Canadian history, of wartime history and history full stop, you might even um, say. Perhaps I can, uh, and then somebody, Linda, Linda Queet saying also, also Canadian and know nothing about it. Can I pick up on that? Um, perhaps actually asking some of the Canadian members of the audience to chip in if they would like to, sort of how is this episode regarded in Canada now? And also perhaps even more importantly, how is it regarded at the time? How much was it publicized? How much was it debated? Was there a controversy about it in the ranks of those in, well, the public also, but also those in authorities? Perhaps you can start, Nancy, by telling us a little bit more about that. Myself do not know what went on in Canada. Um, I did go to Ottawa and I sat in the archives. I was really, it was, it's so hard to get, the, there are just little details here and there about what really happened in the camps. And um, I, I was trying to, there are um, diaries that the camp commander or someone else in the camp kept and sent back and forth. And I was very focused on just what was going on in the camps. I do know um, that that part of Canada at that time was very, the guards especially were very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And I do know that the Canadian government, when the, um, when the refugees were interested in staying in Canada, they were not interested in having that happen at all. I think there were some that stayed and they were able to get through those problems, but there was a lot of anti-Semitism in, in the French part of Canada, which I was surprised at. I didn't know anything about it, um, but it came out. That's what the only thing I, that came out. And I, I don't know what was going on, you know, in the newspapers and things like that. Does anybody in the audience perhaps have anything to contribute on that front? Because I think Nancy and I would be very, very interested to hear from you. You can actually unmute yourselves, or at least I think you can. If you can't, then uh, type in your name and I will um, ah. unmute you. But I, I think, uh, is there anybody who'd like to, to contribute here? Hello? Yes, hi. 
Jennifer, here, Jennifer uh, and I. My father was interned on the Ile Noir, um, in Ile Noir, um, in Quebec. And I've seen pictures of it online, and it looks horrific. It seems it was an old fort sort of island. Um, and I know he went out on the SSS trip, but I don't know anything about the conditions there. You know, on the island in in on that in that camp, presumably they were similar to the ones you've described. Does anybody know anything? You know, kind of sort of moving from the conditions in the camp, which clearly were absolutely atrocious and reprehensible. But I'm very curious to know about the kind of broader context in Canadian wartime history. How does this, how does this sit? How does it fit? I, I, I can add that the Canadians had people they were picking up on their own in Canada and had those people in camps. So there were, there were a number of camps all over. There were maybe 14 or 15 camps so the British weren't populating all of those. Some of them were from Canadians, from Germans who were, um, you know, kind of like in the A level that they thought were Nazis that were uh, in other camps. And they went throughout um, um, Canada all, all over. And I, the, I, the, some, the number of the people, a number of the Jewish refugees on the Ettrick went to another camp besides Camp L when they first arrived in Quebec. When Camp N, the kosher camp was set up, many of those were sent back, left the, the, the um, original camp they were in and went to Camp N because they were trying to put all of the Jewish refugees in one place. Now they couldn't do them all because there were just too many of them, but um, they were trying to consolidate that, especially if they were kosher or whatever. The Jewish community in, in that area was actually providing them with kosher food. It really was a kosher camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's leave that bigger question perhaps aside for the, for the moment and the comments, questions flooding in. So I think probably I'll just go through them if I may, sort of as they came in and we'll, we'll sort of play it by ear slightly. Um, Hazel Stein saying, I'm the British child of an internee. Is anyone else? I'm sure the answer is yes. Let's keep that one aside for the moment. Gina Watson, yes, I am too. Um, Hazel Stein asking, are the records now open in Q Public Records Office? Are they now open access? Is there a problem in getting hold of the evidence? Um, yeah, I was told that they are, but it's by appointment only. You mean because of, because of COVID, yes? Yes, okay. but I went, I went to the Kew Public Records Office, oh, it must be at least 10 years ago, and got other records for my family, but the, there was nothing on, on the internment. Um, and I'm, I'm mystified, Nancy, because my father told my mother three things about his internment, which was, he lived, they lived in log cabins, it was very cold, and they chopped down trees. And he taught me how to chop down a tree. You know, you don't stand behind the stump because it whips out. I've never forgotten that, not that I've chopped down trees. But um, so he must have been somewhere, what, further north in Canada? Quebec Quite is different. far north enough, I can assure you. I just wonder, Hazel, that sounds like a very sanitised account of his experience. Am I, yes. am I right? I think, uh, I, think I mean, nobody talked about it, you know, that, that they didn't. To me now, I'm really proud of how he survived this. But, you know, to be classed an enemy alien was not something you were going to be very public about. And anyhow, people didn't talk about the Holocaust, they didn't talk about the war, really, you know, it, it was very different than those years after the war. For sure, but this was the country in which the refugees thought they were safe to be treated like this. I mean, that, that's... Yeah. Yeah, anyway, um, indeed. May I also mention, I mean, again, many of you already know, I mean, the whole Dunera episode, those who ended up in Hay Camp in Australia, is another oh, yeah. much neglected yeah. corner of history, which is very much the kind of Antipodean counterpart, isn't it, Nancy, to, to what you've yes. been describing? And yes. search has been done, but more, I think, needs to be investigated. Um, indeed. Yes. Uh, right, Brenda Green, I'm originally from Winnipeg, now live in Dallas, so welcome, uh, Brenda. My father was in camp is that 
Camp 1, or Camp I, later known as 41, on the Isle of Noir. He arrived on Sobieski in July 1940. And then we've got Gina Watson saying, yes, my father also arrived on the same ship. Um, Penny Rubinoff asking, will there be a book, <laughs> articles? Have you published? Um, I think we're all waiting, you know, listening with bated breath. So, um, Nancy, there's clearly a book in the offing, or are there indeed any right. other publications but, that one might? I haven't published anything about this, except I have two long chapters in my biography of, of Fuchs um, that starts with the, you know, what happened in England. He was in Hyten and Isle of Man and then shift, shifting over to Canada. So that's what, that's what I have done so far. Uh, I, I find it, I, and, and actually this was my favorite part to write about it. I just find it fascinating because, it's, it's partly because nobody knows about it. And I, to find other people and people you know can tell you about Heighton and they can tell you about the Isle of Man but I'll say I would contact people and I'd say do you did you do anything in Canada no and I know there are more records I you can't imagine how many people I wrote to in Canada about trying to get there was a a, um, a security officer in each of the camps and they filled out reports they have to be Someplace, maybe they got thrown away. I don't know if they could be at MI5, which is, but they're, you know, I'm not going to get those. I've tried every place in Canada to try to find these things because they were reporting on the different people and they were reporting on the communists. So I was interested because of Klaus Fuchs, but they were reporting on everybody. And they had people in the, in the group, in the camps who would report on the other, you know, internees and things. Right. So, um, there's a lot of information still to figure out where it is. Does anybody have any like to throw on that? I mean, where are the archival resources in Canada? Do they still exist? Let, let us know. Um, right. Uh, a good, yes, Peter Skite, my dad was interned in both camps, um, L and N, from 1940 to July 1942. Klaus Fuchs was in the same barrack block so you might want to be in touch with each other. Um, Gabby Brown, my father was on the Sobieski too. I have, this is important, I have many letters that he wrote home from Camp B but he had mainly positive memories of his experiences as a seven year old, 17 year old boy and I think this touches on something important uh, Nancy that you mentioned that actually in retrospect both I think in relation to the Isle of Man but also clearly to Canada as well a lot of the former refugees <sighs> looked at their experience more benignly yes than they actually Felt at oh, can yes. I just uh, right. can I just make a contribution actually Monica can you hear me yes yes I can of course yeah so I have many letters like this uh, this one actually this one says prisoner of war um, and mainly he's asking about how his family are and whether they would send warm trousers or chocolate to him um, but he to be honest my dad was 17 and I'm I, I don't know if you know whether there was a differential in terms of the, you know the, the sort of whether the camp, he was in camp B and then camp, camp T and then camp B. But he didn't complain about privations. He did say it was sort of like quite tough, but he had funny stories to tell about the chopping down of the trees. I mean, it was along the lines of, imagine a lot of Eastern European intellectuals all being given axes and told to go down and, <laughs> and cut down trees. And he said, and the Canadian soldiers kind of rolled their eyes and said, look, you hold the rifle. I'll show you how to chop down the tree. There is that he, surreal quality, Gabby, as well, isn't it? That comes out yeah. in many of the accounts of internment. Also in so there, there was lots of stuff like that, and he also, but he did remember the German, the Nazi prisoners coming towards the camp, and they could be heard in the distance uh, singing the horse vessels song about how the blood mm -hmm. of the Jews spurts from under the knife. Mm -hmm. But he said there was a riot in the camp, and they, you know, they stopped those prisoners joining them. Mm -hmm. I anyway, think age, age is crucial, Gabby. I mean, if you're young, you know, you are more resilient. One has to remember that for the older men, you know, many of them had been, I mean, there's a reference to Dachau. I certainly know from the Isle of Man context that, you know, many of them had actually gone through the worst, mm -hmm. quite the worst the Nazis um, could offer. And, you know, here they were faced with another kind of related trauma. So I think age is absolutely crucial, isn't it? In terms yeah, of I mean, he was 17. Mm -hmm. So it was probably a bit of a jolly jape, a bit sort of, you know, famous five. Uh, to some extent and but he you know obviously he was under no illusion about the kind of narrow escape that he and his family had made from Berlin. I think that's absolutely crucial isn't it because again particularly 
with the benefit of hindsight, the gratitude felt towards Britain in this case, surmounted in it, it kind of overrode the feeling of the trauma and the bewilderment and indeed the, you know, the, the anguish maybe that was felt by the experience at the time of being interned. Yes, that sort of gratitude dictated well, the way that it was remembered. Does well, that make my sense? Dad, my dad actually said he believed in British fair play and he thought the British were absolutely, made an absolutely reasonable assumption that he might be a spy. <laughs> mm. And he had, although obviously he was aware of the risks of the transatlantic voyage, he didn't particularly quibble with the reasoning. Hmm. Even when he was in his 60s. Yes, no, these are big questions. I think it's very variable. I mean, age is crucial. And also that discrepancy. I mean, I, I mustn't hog the conversation, but, you know, I've looked quite a lot at artists' accounts of internment. Um, and there's somebody called Fred Ullman, for example. And when you actually read his diaries, they are full of anguish. And then there are various different accounts he made at different stages of his life, where gradually the anguish gets played down. So I mm -hmm. think these are complicated mm -hmm. issues. Let's carry mm -hmm. on. We've got some wonderful comments here from somebody called Sampa Mulenga. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating. Yes, indeed it is. One of my best friends called Ulrich Weigert was held in this camp after being arrested in England. I met him in January 2006 when I was 22 and he was 91. I was friends with him until his death, aged 105 five years and 13 days old back in October 25th, 2019. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he's, he, he, yeah, we, we first met at art class because mm -hmm. uh, I was sort of interested. So it's just at, at a community center mm -hmm. in Sheffield. Uh -huh. um, so it just, I mean, it was, it was kind of, he was, I mean, he was still, he was still quite sprightly. I mean, he did actually walk up many of the hills of uh, Sheffield. Um, but yes, I mean, this story only really came up, it, it just, it, it only, it, I only became aware of it back in 2008 because I was going to go to America for the first time. And my friend, uh, Ulrich told me, I've been to Canada. I went to Canada during the war and I thought, oh, <laughs> there's a bigger story here. Um, and I did, and it, I did over the years, over the 14 years that I knew him from, from 2006 up until his death, I, you know, I got piece, bits and pieces of, of, of that story uh, from his uh, daughters and his son-in-law and, and various other family members. Um, so I think they're trying to compile a few, th uh, compile a few things because mm -hmm. he was, he, uh, he was held on the Isle of Man as well, and he actually mm -hmm. did uh, draw a, a picture um, of, of through the barbed wire of a tree, and there was a blackbird singing on it. So that he, he was always hopeful of getting out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, his history was absolutely fascinating because. Um, I think nowadays everybody thinks the world is in a is in a, a rotten state. But he is, when you look back at his early life from his birth in 1940 to, uh, to what, of that. yeah, yeah, it was it was uh, pretty extraordinary. Has anybody uh, written his life story down? Um, I think it's work in progress. I mean, it's a it's a sprawling story because it it a lot of it began in Germany. So that that gave the sort of that gives some sort of context. So there's and then there's a, then there's the life the life he had in England um, subsequently, um, of which I was uh, strangely part of, uh, you know, much later on in his life. Um, but but you know it it it's always been very interesting because um, he's a he's an extremely gentle man, but he was very, very tough and very, very resilient. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that really humbled me. It's like, uh, it's, it, I, I think uh, during, um, at his funeral uh, last December, I got, uh, I heard about, about the Etterick and the, the squalor and about Prince Friedrich and, uh, you know, all these other characters as well. And, you know, um, it was sort of in passing, but, but it, it was more about him than than those those other people, even though they were in such close proximity, and the kind of squalor and the horror and the um, the unease of those times. 
Um, Some, but, I'm afraid I'm going to probably have to stop you talking, otherwise there won't be room. I'm really sorry, but sure, sure, uh, room sure. for other questions. But thank you. That's very moving and, and fascinating, and uh, obviously a wonderful, a wonderful human being. Um, we do have quite a few other comments and, and, and questions. Um, Right, somebody, Peter Skite, um, quite important, just a sort of legal issue. There was a formal inquiry, yes, um, into the SS Ettrick conditions and the robbery of effects from internees on mm -hmm. disembarkation. Yes. And on arrival um, from Campbell, um, my dad was the stenographer and interpreter, and I still have his shorthand notes. Wonderful. Oh, wow. What, what year was that? Peter, um, I don't know if you uh, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'll have a uh, myth myself. It was 1940. And oh, it was so early, right? Okay. Yeah, 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 it was the same oh, year. It was fairly shortly yeah. afterwards, actually, and yeah. uh, it was uh, reported in the House of Commons, I think, sometime later. Um, and like, I think the Donera, there was compensation paid to people mm -hmm. in some cases, and supposedly the government announced there would be compensation to those on the Etro. But as far as my dad told me, he certainly never got anything. I don't think there was any compensation. What I'd love to know, I've never looked at the, I've only found the shorthand notes when my dad died earlier this year. I'd love to be able to have them transcribed and see how they compare with the official report of the uh, inquiry. That's, that, that's a work for somebody to write mm. up. Oh, but you must, you must do it. <laughs> you must do it. You, you know, the official report is, at the, is in queue. You can see that there. Um, and, and there are those, the soldiers, they did find some, especially the ones who took things out of the suitcases, uh, then they went and fenced some of the things. And so they were able to catch some of the soldiers who had been involved in the robbery and they were brought to court, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. so it was a big to do just to add one thing, Just to add one yeah, short back. comment to that. It was the mm -hmm. Canadians that were brought to court, two Canadians. Yes. The British who had been involved and the British sailors who'd been robbing them. Um, they were never uh, charged with anything. And the government, the British government tried to say it was only the Canadians, but. Um, I oh, I didn't. That oh, that's that's it. I didn't know that there were British, the British on the ship. At the As time they disembarked, yeah. They were stealing? Yeah. Oh, I didn't. No one complained about that in, the things, in their diaries. I didn't read it. <laughs> Hmm. So interesting, so interesting. I've got a number of comments here, something actually I myself wanted to bring up that I just wonder and clearly the other people wonder how what we're talking about today does or doesn't relate to the Canadian, indeed the American, internment of Japanese Americans or Canadians, which of course is another utterly shameful and morally murky, you know, kind of episode. And I think from, from what I can gather from the chat um, comments that actually if people know about the internment of, of civilians in Canada during the war, it is mostly to do with the Japanese Canadians, not to do with this at all. But clearly, you know, that too, I think actually hasn't, am I right? It hasn't been explored sufficiently in all its kind of moral complexity. Um, there was a question about why Canada and um, uh, Rachel Pistol, who I know rather well and has written on internment both in America or in, in actually Rachel, is it Canada? It's Canada, isn't it? Canada and, um, and um, England has said quite simply that it seems that the British government was afraid that there wouldn't be enough space in this country, which in a way is a, a nonsense, but that appears to have been the driving reason why, why, why Canada. Can, can I just interrupt at this point? Yes, please, please do, go on. Because um, I asked that question. Oh, sorry, um, yes. It has been explored in Canada. Um, the government only apologised in 1988. And what, but a, what I think is really forgotten is the fact that at the end of the war, Japanese citizens, ca Japanese Canadian citizens were deported back to Japan and lost their citizenship. Now, there's a wonderful book oh. um, by... Um, Joy Kagawa, if you can see that, mm. which won an award in 1988, which sort of coincides, and she was one of those internees. But the ca Canadians haven't got a wonderful history in terms of how they have dealt with the other. So I think that I do wonder if Nancy has any thoughts about how the way the Canadians dealt with the Jewish refugees and how they also dealt with their own citizens. And, and I don't know that. I mean, I have a sense of how 
my country dealt with their Japanese internees. I, until I started doing this research, I had never even thought about there being Japanese internees in Canada. Um, and I don't know, and the only thing I know about how they treated the Jews was that they didn't want them basically. And they made it really difficult to get, you know, uh, as did the Americans. They, there were a number of people who had family members, their parents were in the US and it didn't matter. They could not get here. Um, it was really awful. They wouldn't let them out. Um, but one thing I wanted to say to Monica about them being brought to Canada to begin with, I read that there were, mostly they were young. They were, the, they were to be between, you know, the 17 and 35 or something like that. They were getting the young men, partly so that they couldn't cause trouble. If they got upset, they didn't want riots. And partly because they didn't have food. It wasn't, I didn't get the impression it was ever space. It was food that they didn't have. They couldn't feed everybody. Um, it, even just the delivery system for that, which shows that, that, that at least at the very beginning when things were totally disorganized and unplanned, people weren't getting enough food. Whereas in Canada, they had, that was one problem they did not have. They had plenty of food. No, clearly there are multiple reasons it can't be one single factor. I have an interesting um, uh, connection to be made here. Claire Weissenberg is um, connected with the Kitchener Camp Project, which is a fascinating, um, again, little known episode in, in British uh, wartime history. And um, I think she asked at one point, or maybe it was somebody else, um, whether, well, in fact, I think she said, sorry, I'm scrolling through the numerous comments here, um, that a number of people, um, that there is, in other words, a connection between those who ended up in Kitchener camp after, mostly after Kristallnacht um, on, in the Kent um, countryside, um, and then those who were deported to Canada. And I don't know, Claire, whether you would like to kind of make it, unmute yourself and chip in at this point. You're very welcome to. And can I just ask everybody else who's not talking to mute themselves again so we don't get any interference? Thanks a lot. Clara, are you there? No, she certainly was. Um, I don't know whether, I'm, I mean, maybe Nancy, are you aware of any connection between the Kitchener experience and the Canadian one? I don't know that, but Claire put up a sign saying she had a terrible signal and she couldn't respond to you. Oh, so what a shame. Well, let's, let's, perhaps you and she could be in, in contact. Uh, yes, because I, I, I don't know. Um, Right, an interesting question here um, from Alan Morganroth. Um, do you think the later treachery of Fuchs can be used to justify the internment of the communist aliens at the beginning of the war? They were anti-Nazi, but they were also potentially anti-British. Well, it's interesting. I, I, when I first knew, thought about this internment, I thought about our, I don't know if you, our, our imprisoning um, men from the, uh, uh, during the Afghani war. And um, my impression was, I would say what they, I don't think it was justified because I think he was one of, um, you know, maybe there were, maybe there was another person, but of the thousands and thousands, you know, you don't, you don't need to um, imprison them all because of that. But uh, I think it may have encouraged him to become a spy because of Hans Koller. He didn't, he, he became very much involved with Hans Koller, who was a very charismatic person. And Hans Koller was a recruiter for the GRU. So if he hadn't been in the camp, he was, he also was very upset about the tr that treatment, as were many people. As I said, they got over it and they went on and most of them didn't become spies. But um, it certainly didn't, uh, he felt he was there because he wanted to fight the Nazis, not be put into a camp. And so um, I would argue that it was the camp experience, putting him in the camp may have encouraged him to become a spy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, a very specific question, um, partly relating to that from um, Sally. Um, Nancy, have you found any diaries or journals written by the pro-Nazi German internees? I haven't. Um, I didn't look for any. And as far as I know, the diaries that I looked at were the Imperial War Museum. Now, it's possible that there was somebody who was a Nazi who ended up becoming a citizen here and, you know, they, they did an interview. Um, so I can't say that there isn't anything there because there's 
huge amount of material and I did not look at it all. I just looked at the things that mentioned books, but it, I'm a lot of people mentioned books, so I look at a lot of them. Um, but I don't know anything about any of the uh, Nazi or pro-Nazis uh, that were in the camps. So there is clearly much more to be found out. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Now, I think we should probably begin to round things up. Does anybody have any last questions to ask? Um, I'm just scrolling through to see if there's anything we've overlooked. Um, yes, I, I, I just wanted to say more about um, how they came back to the UK, although I do know quite a few did stay in Canada. But my father had two brothers who, who were in the UK who had not been interned. Um, mm. And he came back and worked for the BBC monitoring service in the German team. Mm. And my mother was sure that, that he, his brother posted him an advertisement and he replied to it. And that's how he came back. But I'm wondering from what you say, whether this Alexander Patterson interviewed him and said, right, you go off and do that, or that would suit you. Do you, know, do you have any more information? I do not. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's those kinds of pieces, like his notes, how they, he made the decisions he made and what he took down and who he spoke to. I never came across that. I didn't look that much for it, but I didn't, I looked for everything that was in the National Archives and the Imperial War Museum. I didn't see it there. I looked in Canada. So someplace there's just this whole internment trope, unless the Canadians mm. put it away. Mm. We, you all Records get I, destroyed, I, don't they, accidentally on purpose, I think, you know, that is. Yeah, they clean out. Why do you need this stuff? You know? um, in answer to Hazel's question, though, I have a, a remark from Claire Weissenberg. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, Julian Layton apparently was a key person in getting people released. Uh, Layton was an Australia. Ah, okay. No, that's a confusion. Layton was in Australia, Patterson in Canada. So Patterson remains the main, the main figure there. Um, oh, right. Um, Hi, can I, can I come in? Yes, please, please do. Hey, sorry, I, I'm, I'm Robert. I know it says Stephen, but I, I'm actually uh, Robert. Um, yeah, no, I, I just very, Briefly, I've been researching my great uncle who was on the Ettrick, um, and just a few few thoughts I had. Um, I've done quite a lot of research, Nancy, probably in similar archives to you. Um, he he managed to get a visa out of Berlin in '39, um, was sponsored by Quakers, and worked on a farm in Devon. Um, he was then. Um, uh, interned and deported uh, in Hoyton and then deported on the on the Ettrick. Um, he wasn't in Camp N initially, he was in Camp A uh, at, at Farnham. Um, Farnham. Mm -hmm. um, and he was due to be released, but a Senator Wilson, um, who was chair of the Canadian Refugee Committee, I believe, um, interviewed him and he wanted to gain Canadian citizenship. Um, he wasn't interested in British citizenship. Um, so he stayed, he stayed in the camp uh, in a, and then in Sherbrooke and, and was released relatively late. Mm -hmm. um, only then to, he finally was uh, enlisted in the Canadian Army and actually uh, saw, saw service in, at the very end of the war um, as, as an interpreter in his battalion's um, intelligence section. Um, he then uh, did, uh, after the war, um, uh, was in occupied Germany. Um, so it's a fascinating story. Um, he then lived in Montreal and, and died in 2014. Mm. Um, but just one, one thing I was going to say, he, you know, he claimed that he volunteered for the Ettrick because he wanted to go to Canada. Um, and and um, it's, it, it's, it's, I, it only, I've only was going to bring it up because um, there was this sense that Canada was this kind of uh, the idea of it for a lot of, um, I think, uh, refugees from from Nazi Germany, Canada seemed was this sort of attractive uh, place, um, and and I I don't know if it's if if this is a more common theme, but I know that for example in in Auschwitz the um, the clothing store was was uh, colloquially known as Canada, 
because it was something that you may survive Auschwitz if you were rather than hard labor or, 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 or um, mm. a, a gas chamber. Um, and I don't know, I just thought it'd be interesting to think of, you know, uh, Canada as this sort of, um, you know, you know uh, um, kind of the promised land or, or somewhere mm -hmm. to rebuild your life after, after the war. Well, you know, it's interesting that he says that he went there because, because on the, many of the people, there was a rumor that they might be going to Canada, but they weren't, many of them didn't know that they were going to Canada and they found out while they were on the ship and then they knew for sure when they saw they were in Quebec, but it wasn't announced that, you know, anybody, they weren't asked to volunteer. I mean, there were some people, um, who got themselves on the ship and other people who changed places with people and got themselves off, you know, before they ever left the Isle of Man. Now they also came from Heighton too. So it, it's um, possible that at Heighton they did know and they did tell them if he came from there directly. But in, on the Isle of Man, it was, most of them didn't know where they were going, which just added to this sense of uncertainty and anxiety. You get on a ship and you don't know where you're off to. Um, and then a few, there were rumors of Canada, but that was all. I think that's an important, important point. Lots of other interesting things coming in at the last minute. Um, right, Rachel Pistol um, pointing out, in fact, you can all see the chat. She's given you the details of the book that actually compares internment in the USA and in the UK, which is obviously an interesting, important topic. Um, right, I just... Um, there was something else that's now... Yes, um, from Marcia, a question about were there any escapes documented? She points out that she's been looking at her website in Mich uh, looking at Michigan newspapers and German POWs broke out of Canada into the US. And I wonder, is there any comparable phenomenon? I never came across any refugees yeah. escapes. And I don't, I would be surprised if there were any, but there were some um, Nazis, either in, you know, pro-Nazis or, or POWs who did escape and were not many, but some uh, that were recaptured. As far as if I, I'm, I was, it was kind of vague because it wasn't in either of those camps. Um, so it was someplace else and I just kind of picked that up as a little detail, but I'm pretty sure there were a few, but nothing horrendous, like a whole camp getting out or something like that. No, I think there was a similar occurrence on the Isle of Man that actually a few pro-Nazis tried to escape uh, successfully mm -hmm. or otherwise. I think, I mean, I wonder if there was actually paradoxically and in a way perversely a sense of solidarity in that shared traumatic experience of being interned. And as you say, also very lively, creative and intellectual life that actually somehow lent a kind of cohesion mm -hmm. to the experience that actually made it less likely that they would want to escape, maybe. Um, somebody and, and they they all knew each they all knew yeah. each other a little yeah. bit. They were picked up from like all the Cambridge students kind of kept together. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were singular people who were there, but many were picked up in groups. Many of them were university students, and so they you know they they had friends. They weren't there by themselves, which was good. I think a good point indeed. Uh, two mentions of relevant books which I'd like to mention. Do you know the book called Deemed Suspect? By I Eric do. Clark. I have two <laughs> copies. <laughs> A long description of internment in Canada. He was in various yes, countries. Very good. He was a distant relation of mine. So again, you might want to, uh, yes, we'll make the contacts there. And somebody else has mentioned a Canadian book, Penny Rubinoff, uh, None is Too Many, Canada and the okay. Jews of Europe, 1933 to 48, by Irving Abella and Hirsch Trope are both academics. That sounds one worth mm. knowing about. Indeed, indeed. And perhaps most importantly, and I think we'd better <laughs> round off very shortly, uh, somebody, and I'm sure he's not the only one, has suggested we should, let me just um, find the exact suggestion. Um, has it gone? But yes, no, the idea of sort of setting up a kind of um, a group of people with a mutual interest in the Canadian internment. And I wonder, Nancy, whether you'd like to be the kind of spearhead, the kind of focus there. Um, I, I, um, I would be glad to participate. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I could, I will do what I can. I don't know if I can spearhead it too much because <laughs> I've got a lot going on. Um, uh, yes, it's Peter Skite who contributed earlier saying, is it possible to set up a contact list of those interested yes. in setting up a discussion group on Canadian internment? Yes. That'd be fascinating and, and maybe we can find more information. Just Absolutely. Like, I mean, try to figure out who knows whom, especially if there's some Canadians. It's always, it's, 
you know, everybody knows somebody eventually that can be helpful. And if you're in, if you live in the country, you have connections that, you know, others like us, us either Brits or Americans just don't have. And so I, I found it difficult to, to, whereas here I can dig up almost anything I need. I can't do that in other countries. It's a lot harder. So that's good too, is just to find more. What I can certainly do, Eventbrite allows one to have a record of all the email addresses of people who've signed up. So with everybody's yes. permission, of course, I could then circulate them. So yes, I have to think about the logistics of that. But if everybody's interested, mm -hmm. then that would be one way to go. And the last yes. question from Gabby. Um, no, there's somebody, hold on. Do, <laughs> keep on coming. Uh, Gabby's asking, has anybody got any photographs? I've lost the one I had of my dad. It can't be outside a cabin. So mm -hmm. photographic records, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, the archives in um, in Ottawa, the National Ar Library and Archives of Ottawa has a lot of photos. And uh, personal photographs as well, if we set the mm -hmm. lines of communication mm -hmm. going. And lastly, perhaps Brenda Green, is anyone here who has a connection with Winnipeg quite specifically? I'll leave you perhaps to sort of enter uh, your names in the, in, in the chat box there. And so it could go on quite clearly. How very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening in and being so interactive. Yes. It was nice that we could actually talk, literally talk to each other on this occasion. I'd like to just end, if I may, by, well, just reminding you, first of all, of the wonderful recording of Nancy's talk on Klaus Fuchs that is on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel. And also the fact that in the two past series of events. There were various sessions on internment. There was one on mu music and internment on Murug, Camp on the Isle of Man, and one about Hans Gall's satirical cabaret in Douglas, What a Life. So check them out. They're all there on the mm. YouTube channel. But also perhaps most importantly to alert you to the fact that there are, I was going to say two events, but actually there are three events which I'd like to mention that are coming up in the next week or so. Um, one of them is actually connected with the Dunera, and I hadn't actually thought of it at first, but on the um, Tuesday, the 3rd of November, it's going to be a talk by Simon Lake, curator, erstwhile curator of the wonderful German Expressionist collection at Leicester, uh, talking about a new book he's written on a very extraordinary, but again, totally unknown German, non-Jewish painter called uh, Johannes Matthäus Koltz, K-O-E-L-Z. And I've read his book and he will be talking, I'm sure, about the fact, the quite detailed account that Koltz himself gave of, once again, the appalling conditions that prevailed on the Dunera. So if you're interested in the Australian yeah, counterpart, terrible. listen in to that if you can, or sign up to it. If you can, if you can't, again, it will be recorded and uh, uploaded onto the YouTube channel. But most importantly, perhaps of all, on the 4th of November for the final day of this round of talks there are going to be two talks, two sessions which directly relate to the Isle of Man, not to Canada, but of course once more there are many links. The first one is at six o'clock on the 4th, Yvonne Cresswell, who is the very well-informed um, uh, curator of social history at the Manx National Heritage on the Isle of Man in Douglas, who will be talking about the rich archival resources open to everybody, actually, potentially, with an interest in the topic. And then she- uh, Monica, I have been there. I got myself to the Isle of Man. makes a I'm huge difference. Library, so I have used those archives and the people are wonderful there. Absolutely, indeed, I agree. And then lastly, at 7.30 on that same day, will be um, a kind of round table sort of discussion by members of the so-called Russian Heritage Cross. Now, not Russian, as in Russia, the Russian, R-U-S-H-E-N, which relates to the <laughs> south of the island where the women were in town. And this again is a totally unexplored, underexplored area. The women, you don't, many people probably don't even realize that many women were interned. But, um, and so David Vertime and his colleagues on the Heritage Trust will be talking about the women in Tony's experience quite specifically. So much to look forward to. I hope to see some of you there. And once again, thank you very much, Nancy, in particular. Thank you, everyone, for being. That's thank you, Monica. Thank Monica, you, you, thank you. you deserve a lot of thanks. <laughs> it's a great pleasure. Thank you. All the best, everybody. And we'll now have a good day. All right. <laughs>